Welcome to Opel STV. Today I'm in Johannesburg together with Jacques Conradi. He's an executive director and fund manager for Peregrine Capital. Peregrine Capital runs a South African based or South African focused equity long short hedge fund. The fund has a track record dating back to 98 and has been compounding at 30% annually. So that's a very impressive picture. And Jacques, I'm curious to hear more about yourself, about the company, and particularly about the strategies that you run. Peregrine Capital was started in 1998 by Clive Nates and David Fraser uh, with a seed capital of 30 million rand from Peregrine Holdings that listed on the JSE at that stage. So we're about 17 years, a little bit more than 17 years old at this stage and we're the oldest hedge fund in South Africa. My own background, I'm an actuary by training. I started working at an insurance company for a few years but always had a passion for investments. So I joined Peregrine Capital in 2007, just before the global financial crisis hit, and I've been with the business for a bit more than eight years now. I think I was really fortunate to join in the 2007 to 2009 period, because I really believe that in bear markets, you learn the most valuable lessons. So to have started your career like that and, and seen how the market behaves and the type of things that can happen, I think has just been a great experience for myself. We currently manage about 6.2 billion rand, which is equivalent to around 470 million US dollars. Our flagship fund is the Peregrine High Growth Fund that we started in, in middle 2000. Um, I mean, that's also the fund that you mentioned, that you spoke about earlier, that's compounded at 30% since inception. Peregrine Capital, the management company, is owned 50% by Peregrine Holdings, which is actually a listed company, a listed financial services conglomerate on the JSE, and 50% of the business is owned by, by the management team, myself and, and the other fund managers. We run the fund with three fund managers, so David Fraser, the, the original founder, is still part of the business, myself and Turby Lochner is, is the other fund manager, and we've also got a team of analysts and traders that, that work in the fund with, with us and help us analyze and lots of variety of companies. So Jacques, please explain us more about the specific strategy that you run in your fund. We are very much bottom-up stock pickers that do spend a lot of time researching the companies we cover. So we would start with going through the annual reports of the last several years in great detail and building up models of the companies we, we analyze. And then I guess an important part for us is to then go to meet with a management team to assess the quality of the management team and also understand their strategy for the company going forward and, and for growing the business. I would say that there's, there's probably many funds that operates with a similar bottom-up stock and picking approach and I guess generating alpha is hard. So even while, while many people can follow the same investment approach and philosophy, I guess not, not everyone generates the same alpha. So I can maybe talk a little bit about what we think we potentially do differently because I mean, we pretty much think that investments is a, is a zero-sum game in the end. All of the, all the asset managers compete for the same returns. In the end, the sum of all our returns must equal the market. And I guess when your fees comes off, the, the industry overall probably underperforms the market by their fees. So generating alpha is hard work. And I, I guess one of my favorite quotes uh, from Charlie Munger is that investing isn't easy. And anyone that thinks it's easy is stupid. So I guess, so, so, so coming from that, I, I think your, your investment team is, is clearly the most impo important part of, of generating excess returns over time. You need to be able to outthink the consensus in the market. So I believe we've got a very strong team. All of us are really passionate about markets and I think you need that passion to drive you. We all spend a lot of time trying to understand our companies and we do a lot of reading on the investment industry, on our companies as a whole, and I guess even in our holidays and free time, we never really fully switch off. You're always involved, you're always, I guess, following up on the news of your companies and, and I guess trying to stay as close to them as possible. You have done with your flagship fund 30% annually. Uh, this is really, really impressive. And I would guess that this is a really vast and significant outperformance of your underlying market, the South African stock market. Now, please explain to us, um, how do you create this alpha and uh, how much have you outperformed the JSE? So over that period of time, the Johannesburg All Share Index did about 15% per annum. So I think we, we outperformed quite substantially. Our initial investors in that fund has made about 60 times their money. So 1 million Rand became 60 million Rand. So we generally got quite happy investors. 
Uh, if I had to go into a little bit of the detail on, on I think what we do differently or, or how we try to achieve this, I guess one of the first points is that we run very concentrated portfolios. We believe at any point in time there's about 150 companies on the JSE that we can cover and that's liquid enough to take sizable positions in. But at any one moment, probably only 10 of them are really good ideas. So our model is very much to spend a lot of time and, and analysis on our really good ideas to make sure we know those companies very well and hopefully better than most other players in the market. And then we take substantial positions in those companies. So rather than adding our 30th or 40th best idea to the fund, we rather just buy more of our top five ideas and make sure we know them really well. So what this, this means is that on average in our high growth fund, our top 10 positions in the last few years have probably made up about 75% of the net asset value of the fund. Now we feel that this might add some stock specific volatility to your fund over shorter periods of time, over, over a quarter. But over the long term, we think the excess risk adjusted returns you earn from this way far supersedes the potential additional stock specific volatility that might add to the portfolio. I think part, part of this approach of running concentrated portfolios is, is building up a lot of conviction in the companies we cover. So we spend a lot of time with the management teams and, and we'll, with the annual reports to, I guess, build up high conviction. Because we feel in times when the markets are volatile, your conviction gets tested. And if you don't have the conviction, you might not make the right decisions at, at any point in time. So and I guess an example of this, um, one of the big, position, big winners for our fund over the last four or five years was an unbundling or a spin-off of a JSE company that listed in about 2011. So prior to the unbundling, we did a lot of work on this company. We went to see management and we had a pretty fair idea of what the value of the investment was. On day one of the unbundling, we started buying quite a substantial position because it was trading at a discount to, to our valuation. But during the first few weeks, what often happens with these unbundlings is there's a lot of forced selling of investors that don't want these. And that position moved against us by probably more than 30% in that period of time. So if you didn't have the conviction then, you might panic and say, what does the market know that I don't know and I guess sell out of the position. But having done our work and being sure of our valuation, we end up buying a lot more during that period of time. So over the last four and a half years, we've consistently held this position and it's probably up more than 600% from, from the low point reaching that sell-off. Just showing you how important it is to have the conviction and not to be shaken out of your good idea at, at that point in time. We're not scared of analysing complicated situations and even situations where there might be some seeming risks around. So we're quite happy in those situations to dive into the situation, do a lot of our own research and figure out what, what the valuation is worth, uh, what the company is worth. I mean, we, we can't just rely on sell side research or just be scared when, 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 in complicated situations. And I guess an example of this would be towards the end of last year, one of the South African monoline banks actually went into curatorship during in, because of insufficient provisioning and they effectively went bankrupt. And during that time, there was a lot of volatility in the SA market and especially in the bank sector. And in that period of time, one of their, the, their competitor banks, Capitec, was also facing a lot of pressure as people were saying, is the same going to happen to them? I mean, we did a lot of work on that company, researched it in great detail and were very sure that it was very different from, from the bank that failed. And I guess we built, established quite a substantial position in that. And I think quite a lot of other players in the market was just happy to say, let's wait for the dust to settle here and, and see where things play out. And now it's just a bit more than a year later and, and I guess that share is up more than 200%. So it just shows you, you can't always just wait for the dust to settle. You've got to do the work in the time when, when I guess the most of the risk is around. Because often that's the time when you can lock in the best prospective returns if you're willing to to at those times take a position. So on, on the short side, we ideally look for companies that's got failed business strategies, companies that's losing market share or companies with, with a management team that's not up, up to scratch uh, compared to their competitors. So I guess the short book provides, uh, provides alpha on its own if you can find those companies with real issues, especially companies with aggressive accounting. And, and then we also look for companies where there's a catalyst to, I guess, to, to expose the, either the accounting issues or, or the flaws in the business model. We often find that without a catalyst, it's hard to make good money on the short side if there's not either results or some kind of event that'll, that'll expose your thesis on the short side. 
We also like doing pair trades where you effectively find correlated shares in the same sector, but where the one's outperforming and has a better management team and growing earnings a lot faster than the, than the short against it where there might be some company specific issues or they're just losing market share or, or the valuation is just out of sync. So those are the typical kind of situations we look for on the, on the short side. So Jacques, do you also offer a US dollar vehicle? And if, what have been the returns of that fund in US dollar terms? Yes, we, we do have a dollar version of a fund that we launched a few years ago. That we basically take a replica of our RAND fund and fully hedge the fund to dollars. We try to take no active view on the RAND versus the dollar. Uh, the hedging cost of that would be about 6% per annum at this stage. I mean, the, the hedging cost approximates the interest rate differential between the, the RAND and the dollar at any one point in time, and that's averaged about 6% over the last 15 years or so. So generally, the dollar class investors can expect to earn our RAND returns less about 6% to give you the, the US dollar returns. So that fund would have had a low to mid 20s compounding since, since its existence. Do you have any capacity restrictions with the fund? And also secondly, I'm interested, how is your fund really linked with the performance of the South African economy? We've always been a returns focused business and returns are a lot more important to us than asset size. I mean, all the fund managers have significant proportions of their own net worth invested in our own funds. So I guess part of our goal is to compound that as, at as high a rate as possible. I guess given that we've seen some nice growth in the asset base over the last three or four years, and we've actually about three months ago gave our investors notice that we will be closing our all our RAND based funds at the end of at the end of this month. I mean the reasons just for that are like I said earlier, there's probably about 150 opportunities that's liquid enough for us in the SA market at the moment to invest in. The bigger you get, the smaller that universe becomes in South Africa. I mean, if you're just too big, you can't invest in some of the mid caps where we might find good ideas anymore. So because of that reason, we're actually closing the RAND based funds. We are leaving about $50 million of capacity open in our dollar class funds to, I guess, just get that fund to a nice scale where it's, where it's self-sufficient at, at a reasonable size. And at that stage, we'll reassess if there's ever a massive market sell-off and we can find really good opportunities and deploy a lot of capital in that environment, we can always decide to reopen. But I mean, the decision is now made. We'd rather close before size has becomes a constraint. At this stage, it hasn't been any constraint, but we'd rather be preemptive and, and, and close the funds for a while to see how we, I guess, how we adjust to the current asset base. Regarding your question on the, on the funds linkage to the SA economy, We've actually been pretty negative on the South African economic outlook for probably the last three, four years in our funds. If we were less, I guess, negative, we could have taken much bigger net exposure. But for that whole period of time, we were running at quite conservative levels of net exposure just because we were cautious on the economy. What that means is we try to find companies that doesn't need the SA economy to really grow at a healthy rate for them to grow earnings and do well. So we find companies that's got good strategies and that's taking a lot of market share where you don't need the economy to do well for them to do well. We like companies with strategies that expect where they expand their successful business models into international markets. Uh, so we generally look for things where you don't need the economy to drive the earnings of, of the company in our funds. One of the good examples would link to one of my earlier comments on unbundling. So the, the company's name was Outsurance and they're pretty much the biggest short-term car insurer in South Africa that's got a great direct short-term insurance business. They're really good at selecting the right risks. The business is probably similar to a Geico, which, which Warren Buffett or Berkshire owns in the US. So this business has very successfully expanded their model to Australia. So in South Africa, they're already, they're already at 20% market share and we think here they probably just grow at a similar rate to the overall economy. Whereas in Australia, they just reached break even, they're up to about 7% market share there and we think they can really replicate what they've done in South Africa in Australia, which is actually a market that's about three or four times the size of SA. So if they get their strategy right there, they could eventually make a lot more earnings from the Australian business and the South African business. So that's kind of the type of stories that we, that we like where South Africa, the economy can, can grow quite slowly, but they can still compound earnings at 20% due to their international strategy. So when running in such a concentrated portfolio, obviously risk management is really important. Tell us more, how is risk management done at your company? So this is one of the areas where I think having three portfolio managers gives us a nice competitive advantage on, on how to manage this. If as soon as we lose more than 10% on a position from our starting entry point, 
we generate a, a stop-loss process around that position. So what that means is the primary fund manager or analyst that, that put the position in the fund puts out a note to the rest of the team to describe these are the key reasons why I think we've lost money in the position. Either they've missed the company's missed earnings or there's been maybe a management change or some competitor is taking market share from, from that business. And then he gives a recommendation, should we buy more of the position or should we cut the position? However, at that stage, we take the position out of the hands of the primary fund manager and move it to the other two to basically review the information he provided, debate the position with him, and then the, effectively the two of them gets to make the decision. And what that does, it helps you to remove the, from the position, person that's emotionally involved, and I guess just allows two independent guys to make the call. Now, often in a lot of cases where we think our investment thesis is still intact, we, we end up buying a lot more, and those are some of the, the great times to buy, because if your thesis is intact, the, the share is now cheaper, and I guess we, we're quite happy to buy more. But I think what it's helped us do over time is when there's the first signs of the thesis not playing out, if things going wrong, maybe the company misses their first set of earnings, or they just start losing market share, or they've got to launch a bad product, that's often a sign of bad things to come. So we obviously make a judgment call at that stage, and there has been some occasions where we've decided to cut the position then based on some initial, I guess, troubling signs of the company, and that saved us a lot of money on those losing positions. And we just feel, especially running concentrated positions, if you can avoid the big losers, you probably start every year with a 5% or so head start, just not having any positions in the fund where you end up losing 30 or, or 50%. We also do look at the, our overall net and gross exposure. Because we're bottom up stock pickers, we don't massively move around the net or gross exposure depending on what's going on in the world. We test our individual thesis for each of the shares in our fund, and if they're holding up, we're quite comfortable to hold those. But we would use effectively some macro overlays, so we're quite happy to buy index put options, and we're actually quite happy to pay away a few percent of performance every year for that for the benefit that hedging provides for if there's a big market crash to, to I guess to have the payoff from those puts to benefit the overall portfolio. Look, I, I think two examples are maybe in, in 2011 actually when, when the US government got downgraded and it led to a bit of a global sell-off including South Africa and emerging markets and again now literally a few months ago when the EM sell-off started in, in August this year. In both those cases we had quite substantial put option protection in place and what that then allows you to do is, we always think it's if you go into a crisis or tough times on the front foot, that allows you to make the right decisions at that point in time. Because often emotions become more difficult, you've just bought shares and you've lost 5 or 10 or 15% on them in a, in a matter of weeks and I guess that can easily cause analysts or fund managers to not make the right decisions at that time. So we just feel having this protection in place that's providing the payoff when the rest of your positions in your fund is struggling just gives you the confidence. You know you're down a lot less than the market and it allows you to be on the front foot and then often those are when the, the times when the best opportunities are around. So what those options does is it reduces your overall net exposure as the delta of those options increases so it effectively frees up space in the portfolio to add fresh ideas and just not being down a lot less than the market I think just puts the whole team mentally on the right foot to just be thinking of how we can actually add returns and, and find good opportunities in that time rather than be panicking and, and cutting positions in that kind of environment. So Jacques, from, from what I hear, you, are, you and your team are quite conscious about the mental and behavioral issues and challenges around investing, and you have even worked out specific procedures around that. Please tell us more about the mental part of investing and behaviors. So one of the things we do is after every quarter and at the end of every year we look at our performance in that quarter over the past year to see what's worked for us, what hasn't worked for us. So we want to be in a constantly learning environment. We just feel that you can, be, you can keep improving as a fund manager for your entire career. So by doing those reviews we constantly see where can we tweak and where can we improve our investment process. I mean that also leads me on to I guess another quite important point for us is by looking at these learnings you need every, every fund manager and every business has to figure out what are you good at and what are you not good at. And I mean by looking at what's worked for us in the past, we're quite comfortable that we're really good at analyzing individual companies, forecasting how those companies will perform and, and what their earnings will be on a three or five year horizon. We think that's on a small enough scale that you can quite accurately make those kind of forecasts. We're quite happy to admit that we're not good at forecasting what the overall market's going to do. We're not good at forecasting economic growth what's going to happen with interest rates or what's going to happen with currency exchange rates. Those are not our key competitive advantages 
and we're quite happy not, not to be good at those and, and, and not, to, not to take those kind of views. We really like to invest in companies where you can forecast the business and how it will perform and what the company will earn within a reasonable degree of accuracy three, four years out. That's really, I guess, where a big part of our returns have come from over time is finding those companies that's compounding earnings at a healthy rate and where we can actually forecast how the business will look within a quite a small confidence interval a few years out. I mean, linked to that is we really try to avoid companies where the macro variables play the biggest role in the company's earnings. So, for example, in South Africa, the resource or commodity sector is quite a big part of the market. We actually hardly ever play in that part of the market. Like I mentioned earlier, we, we're not that good at, we don't think we're good at forecasting oil prices or iron ore prices or the Rand dollar. And unfortunately, those variables are by far the biggest drivers of those companies' performance or their earnings. So your confidence interval, even one or two years out in the earnings of the company or the value of the company, it's just, it's just so wide. So for our model, where we like to forecast things within a reasonable degree of certainty, we're just going to happy to quite happy to avoid those companies and find the type of opportunities where, I guess, we can have the confidence to take the big positions we like to take. So what this then means is in our fund, we place a lot of emphasis on our bottom-up research on the type of opportunities that, that provides us and we actually try to de-emphasize the macro outlook quite a bit because we just feel we're a lot more sure about the individual company prospects than the, the overall macro environment. I guess another important thing that we want for, from all our team members is to have a skeptical mindset. We can't just be sitting in management meetings and believing anything, everything the management team tells, tells you. We spend a lot of time on the company annual reports, we go through the numbers, and if there's things that look suspicious, you've got to investigate that and you've got to ask the company about that. We also look at the company's actual products, we talk to the company's clients, and we talk to the company's competitors to, add, to, to see whether things add up to what the management team's saying. We just think if you don't do that, you're going to be caught with some nasty surprises down the line. And I think one more further thing that we do try to emphasize is, is just having patience. So sometimes in markets, you've got to, you can only play with the opportunities the market provides. So in times where there's no really good fresh ideas around, you need to be willing to just sit on your hands. If there's nothing to be done, there's nothing to be done. You've got to keep your eyes open and keep looking for new opportunities, but we're quite happy if a few weeks goes by or if a month goes by where there's no big new fresh ideas going into or out of the fund, we always know the market will provide the, the right type of, type of opportunities again at some stage in the future. So at some of those times, you just need to be patient. Jacques, tell us more about the investor base of Peregrine Capital. Right, so we've got quite a diversified investor base. Clearly the majority of them are South African based investors and actually quite a lot of them have been invested with us for a long period of time, some as far as, well, I guess 15 years back. So having a, a high quality investor base that's, I guess, been with us for an extended period of time is quite important to us and, and we think having a good investor base actually is a competitive advantage in the asset management industry. Having investors that understand your approach and that back you as a manager for your long-term performance just allows you in times of market stress or if you've got a period of short-term underperformance to know that your investor base backs, backs you and will, and will stick with you in that time allows you to keep making the right investment decisions under sometimes some of those stressful scenarios and also allows you to take a long-term view. I mean, on some of our big winners, our average holding period is probably three plus years and generally when we establish those positions, we probably take a two, three, four year time horizon on those positions. So to be able to do that, you need investors that also think in that kind of time horizon to make sure that the time over which you will deliver the returns matches the investor's time horizon. We're quite happy to provide regular updates and have regular calls with, with most of our key investors. We just think it's important for us to be providing them with an update on what's going on in the fund, how we're seeing the market and what type of opportunities we're finding because that just allows them to understand how the portfolio should behave in different kind of environments and I guess it just keeps them on side and, and, and you know they'll be there for you if, if needed and if, if times become more difficult. I think we, we have spent some time to try to build a, our offshore fund and raise some money from offshore investors. I guess what's important for us there is to also find investors that's not just in the fund for, a quarter, for quarterly or six monthly performance that also are willing to take a long term view for us. And we also want a nice diversified client base. You don't want one or two investors that, I guess, make up a big majority of your fund to put you at risk if, for example, for some reason, they become negative on emerging markets or South Africa as a whole. So even though we don't think we're very correlated to the overall economy or emerging markets, it's important that your investors also understand that and that they don't see the fund as just an EM proxy 
that they want to trade in and out of for, for the EM exposure. So, so far we, we, like, we like, I guess, private client and, and family offices as investors, but also we're happy with, with some funder funds that really understand our model and understand how we generate alpha.